activities. Um, our topic today, Scott, if you want to go to the next slide, please, is protecting your farm or ranch from wildfire. Scott Cotton is our presenter. Uh, Scott's currently serving as the chair of the national uh, chair elect, I'm sorry, of National uh, Extension Disaster Education Network, Eden, which all of you are familiar with. Uh, he'll become our chair at the October annual conference. He uh, is the point of contact for the state of Wyoming for Eden, and he chairs the Agro Security Plan Work Group, uh, co chair of the Eden Annual Meeting Committee, and coordinates DHS Emergency Response, Rural Readiness, Community of Practice, and a lot of other things Scott's very involved in. He's co-authored several publications and done a lot of presentations. So our webinar today is being recorded. So Scott, I'm going to let you take it away. Good morning. Um, as we, as Beverly indicated, uh, we are going to talk about uh, protecting farms and ranches from wildfires. Uh, feel free to add comments or, or jump in. This presentation will be a fairly brief. I'll try to go slow. I get kind of sped up when I get on this subject. Uh, it gets pretty personal. In the last 10 days, we've had three wildfires in three different directions within two miles of our home operation. So I spent Sunday cutting fire line on the outside of our pastures. That's not unusual. Uh, the question is, why are we focused on this? Uh, a couple of basic reasons. We've seen wildfire frequency uh, increasing. Uh, historically, we had about 60 years between wildfires in a general area, and we've seen that down almost 19, 18, 19 years more quick recently. Um, in addition to that, um, farms and ranches that experience large wildfire impacts, it's real a real heavy toll on their economic viability. So we've realized with some studies from the Pew Trust and FEMA and other people that over 40% of those operations that are heavily impacted by wildfire become economically insolvent and struggle, usually end up changing ownership or shifting their operational patterns. So we're going to talk about some measures that you can take to mitigate those impacts and a, and a few other things as we go. Uh, this photograph shows a wildfire on the, in 2006 uh, north of Alliance, Nebraska, that's moving at about 15 miles an hour through a, a pine and grass interface. There are several components that we need to talk about. Uh, the first one is pretty obvious, but surprisingly, some people don't really get to it, and that's risk awareness. Uh, you need to know on your landscape what your risks are, especially for wildfire. Some people have a really minimal risk. If you're living on the oh, Shinguti Island off the coast and you get a lot of uh, monsoonal rain and hurricanes, your wildfire risk may not be as high, but that doesn't mean it's gone. Then you should be aware of what you can do to reduce the impacts. We call it mitigation in Eden and in the emergency services, but in reality what it does is it reduces the severity of the impacts. We'll talk a little bit about response approach, even though that's not a protection element, it is the, the part that a lot of laymen consider protecting their farm and ranch, getting out there and fighting fire. And then briefly touch on some post-event actions and, and go from there. So when and where is the risk? Um, this slide from the U.S. Drought Monitor, which uh, the website's right underneath the photograph there, will give you about every two or three days they issue this, and it will show you where drought is happening. We have a real high correlation between this drought map and where the most severe fires are for a couple of reasons, especially in years where we have a fall or a spring with good vegetative growth, followed by a heat period or a dry out. In those conditions, we see the drought is kind of the determining factor behind a lot of the location, severity, and frequency of wildfires. So we kind of realized that we watched the drought map for wildfire risk just as much as we watched the wind map. Now, if you're curious about where the risk is right now or what might be going on right now with your area, the National Wildfire Coordinating Group, after someone, your fire chief or your emergency manager, they usually report to this site, the INSA website that's the bottom bullet. And they will, if it goes more than about a day, they will list their maps, they will list their uh, firefighting plan, and they'll list an update status every day on this website for most fires. So you can go onto this site, 
and please don't do it now. We'll, we'll get to it later. But you can go onto this site, select your state, and it'll show you what fires are active or have been active in your area. You can click on those, and it'll actually show you a map. It'll show you the contact people, and it'll actually show you what their progress was yesterday and what their plan is for today. It's a pretty useful tool. Wildfire risk usually gets the worst when our, our dry conditions and heavy flash fuels that we talked about before, uh, when the humidity drops and then the wind gets higher. All of those conditions add to that, uh, that perfect triangle for fires, and then all we need is an ignition source. In the arid west and in much of the central part of the United States, the ignition sources are usually one of two things. They're usually lightning, what we call dry lightning, or they're acts of humans, whether it's a cigarette or a hot exhaust pipe on an ATV that doesn't have a spark arrestor, or whether it's a campfire that's not totally out, or fireworks. About 50-50 on most years is, is lightning versus human impacts. Now, um, most of us that live in the arid west hate the 4th of July for those reasons, but at the same time, you'll see us sitting up all night after a lightning storms come across, and I can tell you from personal history and from watching other people respond to it, you're never really totally ready when you have a wildfire that pops up because you're expecting it, you might be bracing for it, but you're never really totally ready. So we want to talk a little bit about why farm and ranch operations are at risk. Ag operations in general are more remote than other areas. Um, they usually have limited access maybe one or two roads, but you don't often see five streets leading to a ranch or a farm. We have fewer eyes on. Uh, you may have the owner, the operator, and a neighbor, but often as not, some of those night fires will start and become pretty well established before it gets bright enough that you see the smoke. So farms and ranches have more flash fuels. Uh, city and suburban areas tend to remove lawns to where there are shorter flash fuels, uh, hopefully. And, and a lot of these areas in the farms and ranches may be a little tough to find. It's even though you can give an address for an emergency address for E911, that takes you to the house. It doesn't necessarily tell you where the fire is. And when the fire teams respond, they're going to run to try to get a hold of you to find out how to get to that area. Some of the areas are in rough terrain, and they're often hard to find and hard to get to. And in addition to that, in farms and ranches area, um, at least in the West, uh, the response resources are, are a lot more limited. On an average, we'll have one or two engines covering 60 to 70,000 square miles, compared to, say, a suburban area where you'll have six to seven inches for six square miles. So in addition to that, their fire stations are not likely to be manned 24 hours. It's usually a voluntary system so when it, somebody sees smoke or sees a fire, they call for help, they send out a page, and you may not see the fire for 20 minutes to six hours, and then when you call, it may take anywhere from 20 minutes to two hours for those, any first responders to get to the site. So they have a lot longer response time. The last bullet on this slide is uh, they have less infrastructure. A lot of the rural firefighting areas have pretty good tanker trucks and things like that, but once they run that 5,000 gallons of water out, those hydrants aren't there. Um, where you, in a city or a metropolitan area, you can back a fire truck up and hook it right to a fire main and have an ongoing refilling set of water. And the same thing with other resources coming in. In rural areas, you don't have that usually. I will talk a little bit about that, and Beverly, please try to remind me if I don't, about developing infrastructure in rural areas. So we've set some polls up, some questions, and we want to throw them in here. We want to hear how you have risk in fire areas. So I am launching a poll now. So for our attendees, you should see a poll window pop up, and we'd ask you to uh, just go through and uh, respond to those questions uh, you see in that poll window. And we'll take a, a minute or so to give you time to, to do that. You'll have to walk us through. I, since I have my screen up, I don't say that. See yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Uh, 
Yeah, Jerry mentioned in the chat, be sure and scroll down. There's six, uh, yeah, a total of six questions there. And we're going to send a sympathy card to the people with the worst problems, so don't feel bad. So we've got about eight now, Scott. Eight uh, responses out of 14. So should we move on or? I think folks are still going. Let's see, we've got 10 now, 11. I, in fact, I would say, yeah, we, we can leave the poll up and if, if you want to okay. Okay. continue. So we, we want to visit about those. And one of these things is, is all about protecting your homestead, which is the buildings and the farms and uh, the house and your shops and stuff. Uh, years ago, I was concerned about this on our operation in central, or central Southern Colorado and had a, I was a firefighter and had a long conversation with the fire chief and why my insurance rates were so high. And he said, well, we don't have any refill reservoirs out in your area. So talking about infrastructure again, he offered that he and in the fire department would actually buy a holding tank if I would provide them a location to bury it and let them put a standpipe so that they had 20,000 gallons of water stationed out there so that it, it would cut 25 minutes off their refill time with fire trucks. Uh, in exchange for that, what I actually did was gave them an easement on that corner and they came in, buried it, set up the tank system so that it was accessible from the county road edge and then put steel panels around it and I'd let them put a steel gate in that they had a combination lock to. Within six months, the fire risk for the seven or eight adjacent properties dropped dramatically because once the fire truck came in, once it expended its water, it could run over there and refill up to three or four times. And it was just a simple thought process of working, okay, you're short of water out here, what do we do to address that? Protecting your homestead is, is the same principle, just on a little more personal level. We encourage people at Eden to go to the firewise.org guides because the same principles for, for a home or a home in the woods or a ranch or a farm apply. And those are similar things. There's a whole list of good materials and videos, but to have a wide burnable access area. That, that means that when you design your incoming road to your farm or ranch, make sure that there's, oh, we really like 30 to 40 feet wide because if you have a tree line along that road and I come in there with a brush truck and the fire's coming up on those trees and I've got two or three people with me, I may not commit my truck down your lane because it puts my crew at risk. So they have to have a clear access to be able to get to you. And hopefully it's unburnable. So despite the fact that it might be aesthetic, remember that it has to be practical too and leave a wide access point. Clear debris from around your buildings. Don't stack firewood right up against the building. Uh, make sure the weeds are down. Clear wood, fuel, and propane tanks at least 30 to 40 feet. Propane tanks are one of those things that people don't like to look at, so they tend to uh, build a wood fence around them or put them in behind the trees or tucked up under a porch, and there's nothing worse because once that propane tank's close to flammables, it has a tendency to catch and burn or explode. And if it does, everything that's within strike distance goes with it. So uh, we really encourage people, if you're going to put a propane tank and you want it blinded by something, think about things like cinder blocks or something that's unburnable and keep it out away from the house. Uh, have natural fire breaks, um, wetlands, ponds, uh, Anything that will inhibit the ability of a fire traveling across the landscape to come up to your homestead is a dramatic improvement when the two trucks full of 25-year-old boys drive in there trying to fight fire. They could get an edge on it because they got a margin to operate in. So look for and create those natural fire breaks. We'll talk about fire breaks some more. Uh, this photograph is an example of one that we cut with uh, 
blades when we have fire running across the landscape. It, it really looks like a road with a berm on the side of it. We don't take the time to smooth the dirt out. We just want to make that wide bare area. If your roads are, are wide and have short vegetation around them or wet areas around your property, it provides an insulation to reduce the impacts of that fire and the risk of the fire. In dry country around our area, we actually plan our grazing so that the vegetation close to the homesteads is short right before fire season gets really thick. So we actually rotate our livestock close to the house in like mid-June and late June so that the vegetation gets eaten down so that if a fire comes across there, instead of a 30-foot 30 30 foot wall of flame, it'll drop down to five or six inches, and it's a whole lot easier to knock down that kind of fire than it is something that's real tall. It's important to know your local responders and what resources they have. Um, in much of central and western United States, the old historic fire volunteer districts spread their engines and their trucks out on private properties. So if you have a neighbor that's got a fire truck on him, it's a good thing to know. It's also a good thing to know that it will start and that he knows how to operate it. Uh, if he doesn't or it won't, then maybe you ought to talk to the fire team and get it upgraded and move to a location on the other neighbor that he's perfectly comfortable firing it up and bringing it out in that first 20 minutes. And evacuation plans. Evacuation plans, we've done several webinars on evacuating horses and livestock. Uh, you need a plan, even if it's simply and a plan to get stuff down into an area that's resistant to burning, like a corral that's been eaten out, or if you can get them down into a wetland or something where it, it may have a risk reduction and you need to get your family out and you need to at least have two avenues of evacuation and it's always good to have extra ones. This fire break was outside of Crawford, Nebraska in 2013. We lost about 240,000 acres across three counties. Um, dramatic impacts on the community. We lost 42% of the 4-H projects that year because the facilities burned up that the kids were using. Some ways to mitigate your own risk, um, have some of your own resources on hand. Um, whether it's your weed sprayer that you keep filled up or whether you actually buy a fire sprayer or you have a, a custom privately designed sprinkler system you can drag out and hook to a water pump and throw the intake into a pond. Uh, have equipment to knock down vegetation. Have equipment that you or the neighbors have agreed on to be able to drag a, a dirt line so that it stops the flame. A system to generate a wet spot is one of those suggestions. Uh, if you have streams or any type of standing water body, you might just whip together some pipe that you can hook to a trash pump and uh, hose down the area on your top of your house, the area around the house, around your barns, around any super critical um, assets that you have on a farm or ranch. Um, evacuation equipment I put in here for a real simple reason. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of our clients will have livestock and horses brought in and they have only enough equipment to evacuate about 5 to 10 percent of them within an hour. And that's really a problem waiting to happen. Uh, I personally encourage people to be able to move everything they've got off site within an hour. That way, if you have any warning at all or you have any evacuation route, you can save a lot of your assets. I put uh, the next item here, wildfire fighting clothing. I don't expect landowners to go out and buy Nomex clothing or dragon fur. What I do expect them to understand is that good heavy cotton clothing with long sleeves and good leather boots with rubber soles are the basic principles of firefighting clothing. So if you get out there and you're trying to knock down a little fire, make sure you have something like cotton, not me, <laughs> just the fabric. I mean, I'll come if I'm close, don't get me wrong, but the, the fabric's important because it, it doesn't catch fire readily. Um, it is easy to get off. If it does catch fire, it crumbles and falls away from you. Anything that's a plastic or a nylon has a tendency to melt onto you. And uh, last but not least, when it comes to this, flip-flops are not suggested firefighting clothing. So be practical. Remember, you have to protect yourself if you're going to protect your farm or your ranch. Am I going too fast? Okay, responding to wildfire. Um, it's, it's public knowledge to most professional firefighters and volunteer firefighters that we have more grass fires every year than that we do forest fires. 
We also have more people responding to grass fires because it's on private landscapes often. It's not. And we have more deaths and more injuries every year from grass fires than we do forest fires. They aren't necessarily media worthy. It's farmers and ranchers and neighbors that really don't know how to fight fire that get in trouble because they get out and the fire gets bigger than they're expecting. So I suggest that they train before they fight. I suggest that farmers and ranchers take a little time visit with your local fire department and ask if there was a seminar that they could give you on how to fight it until you, they get there. And they may have different recommendations, but it's important that you get some training. Before you fight a fire, get help. Now, cell phones are a great advantage. They, they allow us to uh, do both sometimes, to, to start out there to deal with the fire and also to call for help. But I will tell you this from personal experience. If you're in the West and you're in a big wildfire, one of the first things that happens is the cell phone circuits block up, and then we do lose cell towers to fires. So then the minute that happens, you better have a standby way to get help. So the old 911 landlines are still a great way to do it because they're buried. Um, always fight fire from the black. Uh, it isn't back from the black, it's from the black. On the left-hand side of this picture, you'll see the smoking embers, that's black. There's no fuel left there. The ground is cooling there. It's usually, not in this picture, but in, it's usually downwind or upwind. It's usually out of the smoke. The wind pushes the fire the direction that the wind is blowing usually. So if you're in the black, usually the smoke's blowing away from you, the fire is not going to get you, and you can come up the back side of it and start putting it out. Now, fires change direction. Why would they change direction? The wind changes. Uh, temperature changes. Uh, fuel load changes. A, a number of things. But you've got to remember, if, even if you're fighting from the black, that they can change in a heartbeat, and you've got to keep your eyes open for changes. So be ready. Um, but there is a lot of producers and landowners that, uh, that conduct a, a big share of their own firefighting just simply because they've learned how to do it. The gentleman in this picture is not approaching it with a safe approach. Uh, smoke. I mentioned smoke a little bit. Um, smoke is usually what, as an EMT that's retired after a couple decades, smoke is usually what gets everybody in fires, whether it's a house fire or a forest fire or a wildland fire on grasslands, the smoke is what this, this uh, disables people. Um, wildfires can move anywhere from 40 miles an hour and have flames up to 100 feet high on grasslands. On forest fires, I've seen flames as far as 250 feet high. Um, so you can be out there fighting a wildfire that's moving two miles an hour and all of a sudden the wind and the forage and an upslope and you're trying to outrun a fire that's moving 25 miles an hour, and that's not a good place to be if you're on foot. Also, embers can carry for miles, so you need to make certain that you, when you're protecting a farmer ranch or the neighbors, if it's blowing towards you, you need somebody spot checking for those embers. We've seen embers carry as much as 12, 13 miles and start new fires behind our fire lines. A little scary, it's, it's, a, it's a role for adrenaline drunkies and and people who are really concerned, but it, it's more important that you keep your head up and keep your awareness up, even while you're fighting. Always have more than one way out. Um, our country areas are kind of limited on improved roads. This road uh, happened to be the main arterial road between two towns fighting fire, and the wind shifted. And between six in the evening and 10 in the evening, uh, this fire tracked 14 miles and crossed over the highway and blocked all of our resupply. It blocked our team movement. It blocked evacuation of livestock. And it created about six traffic accidents. Even with headlights on moving slow, when you drive into that cloud, it's hard to see where things are going. And when somebody that goes in and gets disoriented, what's the first tendency to do? Do you either want to stop or you want to drive real fast and get through it? Well, if you're driving real fast and blind and somebody else is coming through the other way, it's not a good idea. So always have more than one way out. Evacuation is always a challenge. Um, we do have a short course we're working on, and we've had a couple seminars on evacuating people and, uh, and uh, livestock. Pets and livestock are secondary to people's safety. 
Uh, so uh, you'd have to have a good system for getting them out or the, the authorities are going to deal with the human safety first. But many fires move faster than controlled livestock do. We've seen ranchers and farmers that would pull out and say, well, that's just pasture, but I got cows out there, so I'll grab a horse and we'll move them out of the way. Well, good quarter horse can move about 40, 50 miles an hour for a quarter mile, but after that they slow down. And I'll guarantee cows and calves only move about 12, 13 miles a day. So you got to realize that fire can move faster than the controlled livestock do, even if you got them grouped up and herded and you're pushing them. You got to remember that you're heading for uh, some place that you can get them out from the risk. Um, they often get confused and frantic. One of our biggest challenges as rural firefighters is dealing with small Lake Ridge horse owners, because the horses, once they get the flames in their, they can hear the fire. They get smoke in their nose, and they have a natural survival tendency to try to run away. But if the fire's circling around them, they'll be totally confused. We've seen totally tame horses that people had owned for 20 years that would kick and bite and strike at them trying to get away because they're, they're afraid, they're panicky. So we encourage teams that practice dealing with animals under duress and understanding how to read animals and get them out of the smoke. And that includes once you get them clear of the smoke, get the smoke out of their nose, wash it out. That's a whole other subject. Um, try to move your animals towards a fire break if possible. If you know there's a river or a stream or a green strip or a county wide county highway or something like that, get them to that. And if possible, do it sideways so that you're moving, a, you're not running in front of the fire. You're moving out of its line of progression. And that's a little more challenging than you'd think because you're going to have to communicate with the fire command structure to know what the fire is doing. Uh, and that takes some communication, some uh, community effort. And uh, I, we found extension is uh, plays a big role in some of that sometimes. So you want to get them out of the way, but you don't want to just run in front of the fire where the risk continues to follow you. <clears throat> oh, an ounce of insurance. That's better than a pound of cure, right? Um, many farms and ranches have insufficient insurance. Insurance that probably doesn't cover equipment may not cover all of their outbuildings. Uh, it may not cover fences or livestock. And often is not, unless they're working with a group like State Farm or Farm Bureau, it doesn't cover liability issues related to wildland fires. Now, if you start a fire on your property by human action and it blows over into another person's property, you may have liability issues because it, it could be uh, – assume that it was caused because of negligence on your part as far as mitigating the risk. There's this truck um, in Colorado was one that tried to drive sideways from underneath the fire. Fire was going up the slope from your left in the picture and was traveling about 31 miles an hour. Uh, the people in the truck did get injured, uh, managed to get into them with teams and get them out, but it took pretty serious medical care. Uh, and you can see the truck needs a paint job. Uh, and a few other things. So there is, there's always an idea that you can get out from under things, but that's not necessarily true. In this case, these folks lived down a mountain slope. The fire came up parallel to their road, and the updraft and the heat from the fire drying things out ahead of it speeded up the fire so much that it was creating its own updraft. And by the time they got halfway between their house and the county road, the fire was around their truck. So there, there's issues like this you want to think about. Um, uh, insurance issues, um, I talked a little bit about not covering livestock. Most producers, they lose livestock to wildfires maybe once every 110 years, so it just isn't worth it. Uh, your risk needs to be evaluated based on where you are. If you live on a high uh, shrub or forest and grasslands interchange area, you may reconsider that. Crops, some of our crops are, you have federal government insurance available, but a lot of people, especially people less than 100 acres, tend to opt for no insurance because they're small and they don't have as much of a product. Uh, products like the Country Squire program uh, through the agencies I mentioned will protect uh, the vehicles and equipment, your tools, everything in the shop, you pay more for it. But at the same time, uh, when you have a brand new a uh, garden-sized tractor like Virginia's, and it's parked in the garage and fire burns the garage down, they're going to cover the tractor too. So they offer umbrella coverage. 
and uh, uh, for me on on an operation of just 150 cows, it ran about $1,500 a year. So you do pay a price. But when things weren't covered by the other insurance, uh, like a stack of hay and a corral burning up in 2006, the umbrella coverage covered it without even hesitating. So it's something to think about. I would encourage everybody that's listening to share the fact that you need to cover your risk for the real risk around you. Make a fire plan, make an evacuation plan, and share it with your whole family. Uh, talk to your kids about it. Uh, talk to your little kids, talk to your teenagers. Let them know if it happens where you're going. The reality is that nine times out of 10, you know which direction the risk is gonna come from based on where the fuel is, which direction the wind comes from, and where the storms usually happen. Or if where there's a campground, somebody might throw a cigarette out. So you can evaluate where your risk normally come from. Unfortunately, the dry lightning storms start a lot of late afternoon, evening fires just about sundown. And then we don't see them till uh, you get a little bloom on like in this left picture, or the next morning you see the smoke when it clouds clear. And if you see something like that, we sure hope that you have access to federal resources like the slurry bomber on the right. I would not suggest standing in the same place that I took the picture because you can probably guess that by the time I walked out, I was pretty pink. But the reality is you're still glad to see them come. Um, normally, those resources are on the bigger fires. So if you see national resources like that, you've got a big challenge ahead of you. Uh, in this case, we were lucky it was a small fire that they'd had a big national fire just 60 miles north of us that they wiped up the first day ahead of us. Our fire broke out and they hadn't staged out an area yet, so we were we were lucky. And that's about it, I guess, Beverly. Okay, thank you, Scott. I uh, want to remind everybody to look in the chat. We have posted the evaluation link. If you would click on that right now, uh, we'll be coming back to answer any questions that you might have. And again, you can put those in the question box and uh, we'll be glad to, Scott will be glad to answer those for you. So if you would take just a few seconds and do that survey real quick, and then you'll see um, on screen in the poll, you can click when you're finished. So we'll give you a couple minutes to do that. Yeah, also, folks, get your questions ready, and if, if Scott and Beverly are agreeable, if anyone wants to share a comment, we can, uh, we can promote you to a panelist and make your audio and video live. Uh, we'll, we'll, let's see how many questions we, we get, but uh, if anyone would like to go live and share comments or anything like that, you can let, let us know and let me know in chat, or you can also raise your hand in, in chat. And Scott, you, you can see the results in the poll now. Um, I have to open the Q&A. Uh, no, it should be in the poll. Uh, I think no, it, it just said panelists can't vote and it closed it. So Okay. So we've, we've got about seven of, of 14 now. So I, I'll let y'all know when we get close to that 14 number. Okay. Great. Also, folks, if you'll notice in chat, Virginia put a link for the Learn event. Uh, again, we're recording this, and um, we'll make that available within a day or two. Um, so either tomorrow or um, tomorrow or the, the next day, that should be available inside the Learn event. So we've got about 11 of 14 that have responded that there, or 10 of 14 that there. They finished the survey. We appreciate everybody doing the survey because this does help us to uh, uh, improve presentations in the future and address topics that you're interested in knowing about. For those who are done with the survey, again, if you have any questions, please uh, please put those in the, those in the Q and A pod.
I, I recognize some of the names on here. I was I felt like asking Lynette, can you use a mudslide to put out a wildfire? <laughs> but it, that's a little too sensitive. Probably still they've dealt with some challenging issues. So. So we're hovering around 11 of uh, 14 if said they're finished with the s survey. Still not seeing any Q&A, so those of you that are finished, if you want to put a question in for Scott, I'm sure he'll be more than happy to answer it for you. All right, we've got one. We might go ahead and start with the questions. So as the remaining two or three finish up their surveys, um, let's see, Scott. Um, what resources are available to help folks make improvements to farm buildings and make them more resistant to wildfires? Do you have a question for that? The um one of the things that we really encourage people to do nowadays is to make sure they use good steel uh, to build buildings rather than wood. Um, they're more, they're quicker to put up. It's one thing more economical, but be careful what insulation you put in. Um, if you have wildfires, if you have an opportunity to have a means like doors to close to keep the air from drifting through there, air currents of air will drag flame tendrils through open doors and stuff like that. So if you have barns that you can close out, if, if you keep the vegetation from around them, it helps improve them. Uh, there are a number of fire resistant materials for insulation that are helpful. They're very expensive. Uh, first thing to do is talk to your insurance agent and look at your risk factors. Okay, let's see, we have a second one here about um, What's your experience on using leaf blowers to blow out the fire from the non-black side? Wow. Um, I'm assuming that on wildfire that they're going to be fuel-operated leaf blowers. So I guess it's almost easier to ask a question, are you really seriously considering taking a limited run tank of something that has fuel in it and standing in front of the flames? Um, always work from the black. Uh, I will never advocate anybody working from the non-black side. Um, we don't, we'll, we'll wait for it to pass before we'll step in front of a fire as wildland firefighters. Leaf blowers, if you've got a landscape that's say a mile wide and you've got a 20 mile hour wind, uh, how much power does your leaf blower have to counteract that wind draft? Probably not much. So. Um, I would think this is almost the, uh, one of those myths that we've dealt with in the past. I don't think I'd want to step out there with a leaf blower. Um, Scott, I might add here, um, in Missouri we have, um, you, you talked about that developing infrastructure in the rural areas. One thing that we've done, they call them dry hydrants. And yes. it's similar to the tank that you explained, except these are installed at ponds and small lakes, things like that. Are there other things that you would recommend on developing that rural infrastructure? There's a few other things that we've done in forested areas, like cutting out landing zones for choppers, um, making sure that there's wide areas for um, fire response crews to stage a fire response, uh, like a wide clearing where they can bring in, safely bring in resupplies, service trucks, things like that. But one of our big challenges is access to water, as you indicated, and in, in whether you call it a dry hydrant or it's a pond pump, um, it's important to know where those resources are. Luckily, most of the fire teams have a map. It's those areas where there is no water resource. And we in the western United States, we see sometimes it may be 30 or 40 miles between water sources. So that's the areas where the dry hydrants and stuff are extremely valuable. Very good. Any other questions for Scott? Scott, just uh, Virginia just made the comment. She had no idea that uh, grass fires were more deadly than full forest fires, but I suppose that it's because of the extent of range, range lands. Part of it, um, part of it is the idea that uh, people underestimate grass fires. 
Um, we think, well, it's just grass. We, uh, grass fires move flash hotter, go from zero to 60 faster, travel faster than forest fires, have less resources to respond to them, and they're terribly underestimated by landowners. So that's where we get into problems. I see a, a comment from Debbie. Uh, she can't get her speakers to work. Yeah, she had, I, I posted a response there. Just She said she would watch it uh, after the fact. And Debbie's in my system, so she can always pick on me personally okay. later. <laughs> Here you go. Yeah. The, uh, the reality is try to be aware, be prepared, talk to your risk management people that you're dealing with personally, and learn as much as you can if you're going to live on the wildfire interface. And that's what we call it, the wildfire interface. Now, in Missouri, um, where I've been around Missouri, we're, we're dealing with anything from 3 to 14 inches of total annual precipitation in a lot of parts of the West. That includes snow. Uh, whereas uh, Beverly, where you are, you're probably in that 40 to 50 inch precip zone, right? Yeah, I think it's 35 to 40, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. That could be 3 to 15 years worth of moisture for us. Right. So, I grew up in Kansas, so I'm very familiar with how fast those grass fires can go. Um, they can burn up a fire truck a mile away before the guy can hardly get away from it. Absolutely. One of the, you know, I, and I'm not perfect and I'm not an expert. I've been at this firefighting thing for about 27 years, and I have burned up a D6 cat by getting a track caught over a tree sapling and couldn't get it off before the fire got there. I have uh, unfortunately lost some friends. Um, it's, it's serious business. So we encourage people, if you're going to protect your farm and ranch, the first thing is awareness. The second thing is mapping and mitigating your risk and making a plan. So we appreciate everybody joining us today. And I, I was pleased to be able to talk on the subject. Scott, would you uh, go back and share your program again? Uh, we want to see your contact information, share your slides. And if anybody has a question, why go ahead and post it while we're doing our wrap up here. Oh, hang on a minute. All right. Got finger dyslexia. If you go to the one with your picture in that attractive uh, bright yellow outfit, that's what we're looking for. There we go. I didn't do it. Hmm. Okay, we'll just advance it from that slide maybe. Yep. Just... There you go. Let's see if you can pull it up. Don't think you're sharing it yet. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah, it's not. Uh, not let me do it. Can you? Can't you? You can't see that. Yeah. Well, we, well I, was I can't. Say it's, it's not full screen, but yeah. I, I, I think we can see that. Yes, okay. Wanted. You yeah, we can go from there. There we go. Um, so I want to remind everybody, if you do have other questions that you think of later and you want to follow up with Scott, here's his contact information. So uh, please feel free to contact him. Do we have, any, do we have any information on next month's uh, Eden webinar, when it's when it will be held? This is this one. I'll let Beverly talk through this. Yeah, okay. If you want to go back, okay. Um, again, this is a site where you can go back and look at the presentation today or if someone you know was unable to participate, uh, this is the eExtension site. Uh, it's at learn.extension.org slash events slash 2447. Okay, next slide. And we also want to encourage you to use the Eden website whenever you have information or you need information about disaster education or mitigation or recovery. Uh, that is eden.lsu.edu. So be sure and check out the Eden website as well. Um, there's uh, Extension as well as Eden also provide a variety of disaster information and education and as you all know the Zika virus is in the news right now and both sites do have information about that. Uh, for eExtension website go to extension.org slash disasters and that will bring you to that information. Next slide. Okay. 
I want to thank everybody for participating today. I want to thank our technical team, Jerry Hammonds and Mark Bucklear for uh, setting everything up for us. Again, at the bottom of the page here, you'll notice the um, learn.extension.org slash events slash 2447 is where you can find today's presentation. Um, with that, I'll wrap it up. Scott uh, or Mark? Any closing comments? Just uh, Virginia posted a link to next month's uh, Eden webinar. It'll be on August 9th at 1 p.m. And there's a learn link for for that if, if anyone is interested in that. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, everybody, and have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.